Hello out there. I just sit up a little. Much better. All right. Uh, today we're going to do a little bit of time on the SEM. And I have some materials here from. Uh, these are from Clear Lake, which is a lake in Iowa that um, my graduate student, Addie, has been working on. And I'm uh, we spent some time on Wednesday looking around at some of Addie's samples, and she was mostly focusing on um, little fragilaria because. Ooh, what happened? Kalathon. Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the subscription, Kalathon. How are you doing out there? I um, always forget to turn the sound down because before the uh, the stream starts, I'm usually listening to Spotify and then I turn it off so I don't get DCM8. But. Um, These are some samples from, uh, from Clear Lake. And um, we were talking a little bit last night, uh, Pandemic Watch, I think, was looking forward to seeing a diatom where the proximal raphe ends were going in opposite directions like this. And um, I said, oh, that's the, the uh, genus Nidium that has that characteristic. So. But I'd start today by, I just jumped around really quickly and looked to see if I could find an item. And it wasn't that hard. They're in the sample. So, um, nidium have this characteristic where the proximal raphes deflect in opposite directions. And it's really obvious because they have a big wide open foul face. And, uh, most of the diatoms that are this sort of shape that are naviculoid or, or boat shaped don't have uh, raphes that go in opposite directions on the terminal or proximal ends I mean uh, so we'll slow down and take a picture here I was playing around also a little bit with that image quality trying to get it you know as good as possible as they normally do I had a little bit more time to do that this morning because um, I sort of started up the SEM about a half hour ago and started playing with it. Um, sometimes I don't have much time to, uh, to get started, but today we do. So um, I made a note in my say two made a note in my um, uh, what you call it title for the uh, stream today that um, we'll do a little discussion of um, photogrammetry on the SEM um, I've pointed out before that we we've made 3D models from entirely from SEM images. This one's, you know, we cheated and we did half of a diatom and then uh, and then put it together to make the whole diatom. And 
I think maybe at some point in the past it might have been glued, uh, but not very well, so that it would sort of sit like a full diatom valve. And um, so I thought I would sort of talk about the process of doing that a little more explicitly and sort of show some of the photographs that we take uh, in order to accomplish this as well. So we haven't really done it. Um, we haven't done it for a while. I was sort of expecting to um, have it be a project. And I think I had Mallory working on one for a couple of weeks. And then when we tried to do the photogrammetry, for some reason, the Agisoft wouldn't, um, couldn't handle it, so. Hello, Pacific Plankton. How are you doing? How's your day going this morning? I know it's still early there for you. We're looking at a nidium. And, uh, again, the mis unmistakable characteristic of nidium is that the proximal raphians, the ones that are in the central nodule, which is this thing, this little blob of silica right here that doesn't have any holes in it, um, except for the slits, has uh, the proximal raphians deflected in opposite directions. So they come up and curl this way, and they come up and curl this way. And um, there's not a whole lot of diatoms like that. Um, I bet there's probably some other ones from other gen genera in this um, sample that we could probably find that have it, but uh, it's relatively uncommon. I think we're on stub seven. Oh, stub six, which is 14 to 15. So I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, make sure that we have things set up correctly for Addy so that um, 14 to 15. This is nidium, so she could actually use these photos when I'm done, instead of me just tinkering around. Here's the rest of the valve, and so if you're wondering what nidium, what nidium looks like, um, this one's sort of an interesting shape. So this. Um, on the valve ends, when they have this sort of like inward deflection right here before they get to the, um, the apex or the tops and the edges, uh, we usually refer to that as uh, a capitate or subcapitate, which just means uh, it makes it look like there's a little head on it um, at the top. And you can actually see something that's really nice um, here is you can kind of see that when the raphe gets towards the end for nidium, it um, bifurcates, basically. It splits. And the other end produces the same sort of ending to it. Just sort of creates a little uh, cat mouth or something up there. Am I on my own? I am. No mask. By myself. Running the show. Uh, entirely on my own, which is nice sometimes, because uh, I can get a little quiet time in. Um, also, we're really close to Mallory's birthday, and so I suspect that um, she's probably celebrating her birthday, which she should. We'd be happy to have her around, but uh, also, if it's your birthday, you know, you don't need to be at work. You have better things to do. Exactly. Happy birthday, Mallory. Also, I'm glad I didn't bring her anything, thinking that she might have come today, because I would have had to eat it all by myself. Uh, I'll just have to bring her something on Monday. It'll be definitely something to eat, though.
Also, I tried to... I don't know if you could tell. I tried to... Um, <laughs> some Advil. Uh, I doubt it. I don't think Mallory drinks at all, and I suspect she won't drink, uh, regardless of the fact that she's now going to be allowed to, or eventually will be able to allow to here. So... She just started drinking coffee. Uh, other than that, it's just been water, basically, and juice. So... I tried to convince her chai tea is better than coffee, but she doesn't listen to me. That should be pretty clear by now. I suspect if we looked up Nidium on the Diatoms of North America webpage, we probably could figure out what the species was. Hopefully Addy can figure out what the species is. Um, one of the nice things about working in Iowa for Addy is that that webpage, Diatoms of North America, is actually um, run by people who have a summer sort of diatom camp, and that takes place in Iowa. And as part of the students' sort of um, education process, they ha because that website's crowdsourced. Um, they have the students make accounts and uh, add material to the web page. So um, a lot of times the students will then add material from the local places that they collect samples from. So Iowa has been pretty heavily explored, um, except for it's all on the um, sort of, it's on the western side of Iowa. So they probably don't have much from the sort of eastern edge or the middle part of Iowa. It's probably mostly out in that sort of South Dakota, Iowa, Nebraska corner instead. But, uh, you know, relative to working in Africa, it would be a lot easier um, for someone, uh, to, especially if there's been a lot of work in an area. So, the species that Addie was mostly looking to characterize were these little things, a bunch of these little guys. So I'm gonna zoom in and take some pictures of them as well, just since we're here and I have one. And this is the whole frustule for that organism. And the top of his little spine are kind of, uh, crown shaped or something. I don't know. They're interesting. They flare out, which is normal. And then these ones have sort of like a, I don't know, crinkled edge to them. So you can see very easily that they are kind of uh, cruciform shapes, sort of cross-shaped, uh, because of the shadows, right, in here, the brightness in the shadows. Um, but sometimes kind of challenging um, to see their general shape otherwise. One thing that's really nice about this view, it's of course a girdle view, and this diatom is Starosyra, I think, construens. I don't think anybody would argue with me too much about that identification. Um, you can see all of the parts of the diatom. So there's a top valve with its spines that it uses to connect to another colony, and a bottom valve 
and then you can see uh, that there's uh, girdle bands, which we call cingulum, um, that wrap around in between those spaces. And um, some of the girdle bands are attached to the top valve, and some of the girdle bands are attached to the bottom valve, and then they sort of overlap with each other in the middle. And you can really see all of that um, in this image. So it's kind of nice to be able to sort of showcase all of it together. So here's the valve face of the diatom. It's the part that's basically inside the spines on the, on the edge you can't really see. And then this is what we would refer to as the mantle. The mantle is basically the outside edge. Um, if you think of it as like a bottle cap, it's the part of the bottle cap that would wrap over the bottle, right? There's like the surface that's on the top that's basically a circle. And if you were looking at the mantle, it's the side that basically curls over from the top. So that's, that's this part. And then you can see the girdle bands basically start here. Here's one, here's another, here's another. They're sort of like interleaved um, where it's, uh, they form inside the previous one, right? So they're always gonna be extended out from the previous one. So here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one. And they, um, then you can see the same thing happening on this valve, right? Um, with each girdle band inside the previous one. And then out here, this girdle band, you can see overlaps and wraps over the top of the ones from this uh, valve, right? So they fit together. And then you can actually see here, they sort of have like a divot associated with them right at the very edge of it. And then all of the spines in the valve face on this one. It's a really nice view of a whole frustule for a diatom. Hey, Micah, how's it going? Uh, and District 10 Mushrooms. And thank you for giving uh, District 10 a shout out. And Jans, we haven't seen you in so long. Where you been? Uh, open set also. Um, did we, did it, somebody give a shout out to open set? Um, that was a cool video that you posted on our discord open set. It was, uh, it was neat to see the sort of music match together. Um, yeah, it's a little bit like, um, like dial up internet was. Uh, just waiting for the image to appear. This is Staros, made a spelling error. Starosyra Construens Girdle. Ew. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit slow, but actually, I kind of like the the feel of it going really slow like that sometimes. It sort of slowly reveals how awesome it is. This looks like the inside view of that same nidium. This is a little gonfanema. And gomphonema are so variable in the way that their pores are shaped. These ones look like little moons or seas. See, they have like a little flap-like structure. Let's see if I can, right in here, we can kind of see it. It's like they're making a little C, right? C, a little C. There's another little C, but actually it's an open circle with a little tab that kind of sticks out over it, like a diving board. Sticks out over into the areoli. And um, as usual, the gomphonema has a foot pole and a head pole, and this one is a little bit wider than that one. So it's subtle but if you thought of it as like a pen, this is the part that you would write with down here. And when you zoom in on the foot pole, got little Pac-Mans down here, uh, 
there should be an apical pore field. So if we got it right, and sometimes we didn't, but this time we did, um, the foot pole is this end. And so this is the raphe coming in, doing its business, splits through the apical pore field on the foot pole. And then on the other end, so and zoom up the raphe, it's the proximal raphe ends. This is the central nodule. You can see it has a short set, a shortened stri, and over here, a longer stri with a puncti at the end. But if we were to go up here and look, oh, this one actually looks like it kind of has a apical pore field like structure at the top as well, which is weird. I don't think they're supposed to have that. It's really wrapped around on the other side of the valve, but um, I guess maybe it's got some flexibility in its decision making about which end it wants to attach by. It's supposed to be this end. I think that's going to be a pretty picture. The little Pac-Man shaped pores. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, Micah, you've got the COVID. Uh, hopefully you're doing okay. You're quarantined. Um, collaborations are always fun. It's actually my favorite part about doing streaming as well, is that you can get some Some interaction with other streamers. I think it makes it interesting. Haven't been able to catch streams in the week because I got to go to bed on time for work. Man, I wish I went to bed on time for work. It never happens. Uh, I love the football. GOS, GOS, can your SEM do backscattered electron detection and how common is that capability? Uh, GeoWest, almost all scanning electron microscopes come outfitted with backscatter detectors, and ours does as well. Um, let's see. Is there a way I can showcase that for you? So I don't usually use backscatter um, because, of course, um, I mostly just look at silica things. And backscatter gives you differences in density of the material. It tells you a little bit about the mineralogy of the materials. And um, I can, uh, Pacific Plankton, talk a little bit about backscatter. So um, let's see. I need my uh, I need my little tools. Let's see if I can figure out where they were. Ah, yeah. Here's the uh, scanning electron image, uh, sort of classic model for what's going on. The beam's coming down, it's hitting the specimen, blah, blah, blah. Um, when the electron beam comes in and it hits the sample, usually it creates this sort of little um, uh, vase-shaped um, interaction. And the um, secondary electrons, which are the ones that we use to see the topography in um, in the images that I'm creating for you, looking at the surface shapes, come off of um, this first lowest level of um, electron interaction. So the beam comes in, it knocks out um, existing electrons in the material that it's hitting, and those come flying out of the sample uh, at some angle, and they are captured. And that is the secondary electron detector um, sort of vacuums those up by having a positive charge. The backscattered electrons come from this actual like next layer down and um, they give information about like uh, atomic numbers. So that's like the density of the material. Um, and instead of going bouncing off and being captured by the, um, the secondary detector, um, they're normally on my machine, they're captured by this little device. They come out, they hit the sample, and they go right back up, basically straight up 
and are captured by this thing. But because they come out of the sample with a lower energy, um, they don't go flying all the way out to the, um, the secondary detector, which is out here, which is vacuuming up. They, they get captured by this thing. And um, what's not clear, probably because I don't have the secondary detector engaged, is um, what I mean by they go flying straight upward because that uh, detector is actually not engaged right now. And let's see, this is like Gonfanema, I don't know, CF Parvulum. Uh, that's for Addy to figure out later. And um, uh, what we can do, I can showcase it. So uh, the problem is the thickness of the secondary detector um, insert and the way that it works means that the um, the stage needs to be lowered and there has to be at least 10 millimeters between the sample and the secondary detector so um, actually I think they said 8 is where they think it's sort of the minimum if I try to jam it in there now it could potentially hit my samples so I'm going to lower them and of course, um, that changes my focus and stuff that's here on the sample. So I'll just refocus it a little bit. Um, we can still see all of the same things slightly farther away. We just can't see the little things as well. Um, so I can just go ahead and do that. And then um, the secondary detector can be engaged. Uh, let's see, I need to do this. Do something called push in. And you can see that, I think that window is still up for you, right? Yeah, you can see the secondary detector being pushed in right now. And it could be engaged normally and the secondary electrons are still being captured. So right now we have the secondary detector here but we're not actually see, uh, sorry, the secondary electrons are being captured here, but the backscatter electron is now in. Um, but the channel that we're looking at is only the secondary electrons. And if we wanted to actually look through the backscatter, we'd have to do this. So here we are now we're looking through backscatter only. And of course it looks really dark. Um, and I can adjust for the, the darkness problem, right? It doesn't look that different. Um, and that's because it's giving us the aluminum stub that's underneath the sample, the carbon tape that um, the diatom is sitting on, and then um, the silica for the diatom, right? So we're just looking at basically it's mapped out the silica. But because all we have is silica, it's pretty boring. And um, it, it doesn't really look any different for us. And in fact, it's a little less uh, helpful because it's a darker image and also um, some of the topography is missing because it's just basically giving us a reflection of um, the materials but you can see there's some like little bright spots and stuff that are around on the edges it's probably a bit of uh, material that um, was in the solution that dried out so um, again it's a little slightly different density um, if we were to look at some of the junky bits on the slide, so if I go around and look at some of this stuff that's not um, silica, um, we might be able to find some that have different, uh, like where there might be some really strong differences. I think these are probably all junky bits made of the same stuff, um, but I would have to find some minerals that were very different and then they would stand out as being lighter or darker than silica. So uh, give us some sense of the um, composition of the material. And of course, if I really wanted to get the true composition of the material, then um, rather than just using the backscatter detector, which is a good sort of density indicator, I would switch to the EDAX, which is an elemental analyzer, which actually gives me like what's the element associated with the beam on this spot. So it would come here and give me back, uh, you know, silica and oxygen for the diatoms and carbon for the carbon tape that's behind it and gold for the gold sputter coat that's on the sample. 
um, and then probably aluminum because it would penetrate the tape and give us some of the information from the aluminum on the back side, which is what the stubs are made out of. So you can see it's sort of a different view. Um, it looks like, uh, you know, like when Batman engages his uh, special vision or something, you know, like in the movies, there's like just like a different kind of aspect to it. Um, but you can still see all the features. They're just kind of weird looking. One of the things that's nice about the, um, uh, the test scan model is that I can actually play with it. So um, you can do this, which I put in the secondary detector. Now we're looking only at secondary electrons. And I could also do this, which is uh, a partial, uh, A plus B is like partial secondary detector, partial backscatter detector, and then it mixes the signals for us. Um, I can also do this, A minus B, which is our secondary detector, subtracting out the backscatter detector, which is nice. And I can also do this, which is cool, which is split screen, where it shows me, here's what's coming through on the secondary detector with all the topography information. And here's what's coming through with the backscatter detector. And you can sort of see the differences in the two different um, view types that way. So that's really nice. Um, a really cool feature, and if we were to gonna take a picture, for example, slow it down, you'd be able to see the differences between the two, um, the two uh, ways of looking at the data that we have. And um, like you can see uh, in here, there's bright spots, right? That are just not present at all in the topographic tool, the secondary detector. Um, some of the ones over here are visible. But you know, some of these out here are just not visible or they're barely visible. There's some sort of residue on the sample. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. I don't mind going on a little uh, tangent with it. Um, normally, I don't have it engaged. Um, and I also, when I've had it engaged, make a mistake sometimes. So um, you don't want to jam your samples into it for one. So if we want to get really close, we've got to pull it out. And then two, um, sometimes I forget and tell it to um, uh, to use the backscatter detector to see. Like I, when I turn it on to show people it, I sometimes put the backscatter in here. And then um, for some reason, I forget that uh, I need to use the secondary detector and then I just have a black screen and I can't figure out like everything's working. Why don't I have an image? Usually that's the problem. It's that um, I've turned on this thing to the wrong category. And now it's looking in a device that we can't actually see anything in. So with it safely pulled out um, from, the, um, from the surface of it, we can go back to our normal, um, our normal backscatter detector. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So, um, are the lighter bits on the diatom thicker silica? Yeah, probably they are. Um, you might get some areas around the margins or uh, on the um, on parts of it where you would be able to see a little bit more clearly um, through it, right? So. Pretty neat, right? Um, let's see, what did I do that I need to undo? Anything? I don't think so. I think we're good. Oh, uh, the height. Right, I want to move my sample back up. Um, just because I'm being picky about quality of my images. Um, some big diatoms on here. I feel bad because I told Addy, don't look at the big stuff, look at the little stuff because you can see the big stuff in the light microscope. And then I think she took me a little too literally and then didn't look at any of the big stuff at all. So. These are mostly little uh, single lines. Some of them are X's because I think there's some dissolution. Uh, but I love when the stri have like crazy <laughs> They just have create. they look like uh, space invaders, I guess, in this case. They just have really crazy appearances, uh, sometimes the stray. So, a little areoli 
just look spectacular in the scanning electron microscope no matter what every time and um, especially I had enough time to kind of tweak the settings so we got this um, Uh, really sharp image right now because um, I was playing with the stigmation for about a half hour before the stream started uh, instead of making you guys sit through me turning knobs and squinting at the screen a little bit to, to get a better image um, let's see. I'll zoom in and take a picture of the Space Invaders sort of model we got here I want to get enough of it but not too much of it which is always the case it's like a problem trying to get the right amount of what I want to see. And then I think we can do that because it's a little bit dark. your time scope get it right Um, Cargo Cult 055, hello. And Silly Sylvia, hello. How are you doing, little girl? You being good? Daddy, look at chat. I just did. I did. Uh, I was busy taking a picture. Sorry. Um, <laughs> give a shout out to my daughter. Um, I don't think she streams from there. Pretty crazy image. Uh, let's see. Do you look at mostly modern samples or do you look at any paleoclimate stuff? Uh, GeoWest, I am a paleoecologist. Um, my, what we're samples we're looking at right now are paleoecological samples. So they're samples from about, um, let's see, this is about 15 centimeters into a core so my guess is that there's something like 200 years old. Whoa, being raided by Gnome Fire. Hello, Gnome Fire. Um, so, and thank you for the raid. Um, so I mostly look at stuff that's old. And then uh, for funsies, I look at modern stuff. And also when I'm busy trying to um, describe new species or something, yeah, it does look, those are cool structures, aren't they, Cargo? Um, so most of my work and most of my research is, um, I'm not ignoring you, Sylvia. I'm trying to do my, I'm trying to do my stream. Um, yeah, so most of my work is paleo, but uh, I actually sort of cross over between. Um, yeah, I'm catching up. Uh, you want to do Slime Rancher and Minecraft on here, can you? Well, you can't stream from there while I'm streaming from here, uh, if that's what you're asking me. But yeah, you can play the games on the computer. Uh, thank you for the raid, uh, and for the follows. And, um, for shouting out for Gnome Fire. Uh, very cool. Uh, how was your stream, Gnome Fire? Hopefully it went well. Uh... Was the music stream? I didn't get to catch it before the um, my stream started. I was busy futzing with controls. Uh, Diatom's attack is a oh no no might no me a no me oh like a homie I got it. Got it, got it, got it. Um, microscopical stuff is preserved for millions of years. How does that work? Um, well, 
Uh, diatoms have a skeleton that's made out of silica, and silica just naturally preserves. Um, so it's like any other fossil. Um, and I have samples like right behind me here that are 10 million years old um, that have diatoms on them. Um, so they definitely preserve for a long time. Um, Um, you know, in lakes, the diatoms just settle to the bottom of the lake and, uh, when they're done living and they, um, they get trapped there, buried under the rest of the sediments. And so the process is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, they get buried when they're done living and they don't go anywhere. So, uh, as long as that's the case, um, there's a pretty good chance they're going to get preserved. And then um, we collect cores from, um, from the lakes, come in later and basically um, collect the cores uh, from boats or from ice surfaces, um, where we can go out and basically get a stable platform to, uh, to collect the cores. And then... Um, chop them into pieces, date the samples, and then um, process them and prepare them. Um, some of my projects span back 10 million years. Um, that's probably about the oldest is maybe 10 or 12 million years. I don't spend a lot of time outside of the Miocene, basically. Um, but from the Miocene to present, basically, I will work in those, or have worked on those samples and um, will continue to work on those samples. There's something weird going on with... the instrument at the moment. Um, whenever I go through the uh, brightness and contrast rather than coming back directly, it sort of like goes into mystery mode. Sits there and doesn't move. So this is super weird. Uh, I'm not sure why it was doing that, but it'll be okay. It's working now. It was just having a moment. Okay, uh, let's see. Super satisfying structure. Yeah. Here we go. Now it's coming back. Uh, no stream. Minecraft and Slime Rancher are on my account. <laughs> I don't know what you're complaining about, Sylvia. Uh, maybe have mommy help you. Um, oh, a psychedelic variety stream is what you were doing. Experimental. Okay, cool. Sorry, I see you were answering me. Uh, very neat. Oh, you watched into my stream with your psychedelic stuff? Oh, very cool. <laughs> hey, Alchat, how's it going? Um, some of Peachop's crew is here. I guess Alchat does their own streaming as well. Um, this is your first time hearing about microscopical paleontology. Yeah, that's basically what I do. <laughs> dating samples. <laughs> Hello, Anarchy Kitchen. Hopefully you're doing well. Um, and thank you for giving him a shout out, Pacific Plankton. You love computers and you love science. Cool. It's uh, tea and crumpets or something. 
Paleo diet times are preserved better than your computer. Yeah, I'm sure they are. They'll, they're hardy. They'll last for a while. Uh, you're back to baking bread again. It's okay, you take forever to respond to chat. Yeah. You want to stream on your account? I don't think you can do that. <laughs> You'll have to wait till I get home to deal with it, Sylvia. Um, because I don't think you can stream from your account. You're adding almond flour. Yeah, you should definitely check out um, Pacific Plankton if you're interested in um, microscopy and also uh, Del Maximum. Uh, Sylvia is my daughter. She's just uh, seven, and she wants to do things. <laughs> and they're not things I want her to do. So it'll be okay, though. Uh, let's see. We got this weird-looking navicula. I'm going to leave it for Addie to tell me which species that is. Hopefully she knows. Um, so Pacific Plankton looks at mostly, well, almost always live material, as does Dell Maximum. And I look at stuff in the scanning electron microscope. Uh, it's been dead for a while. And so, uh, usually. Um... If you're wondering what this is, I am too a little bit. I think it's a uh, piece of a sponge spicule. Uh, what are they called? Gemosclero gemo gemosclericals or something like that. Um, it's like a, the top piece of it. And then the, um, the rest of the sponge spicule normally would be like extended out in a long tube that's uh, extended along this edge. So like out at the screen towards us um, but the headpiece broke off of it so um, I think it's just yeah, a piece of that you can really I want to get a picture of it because it's really kind of cool looking um, let's see I'm going to zoom in and we'll get really crazy close for a second here I think that is the axial canal of this uh, sponge spicule that's broken and I just want to get the that's the broken part so normally this little tube would be coming sort of at us and You can see all the surface texture out on these edges on the margins of them you can see there's little like barbs on some of them that look like uh like spines on a rose and i'm going to try the auto brightness contrast again and see what happens so maybe it will get rid of this big bright area right here which is less than ideal the rest of it seems like it's actually pretty well exposed but um, if there's one really bright spot, it might make some of these a little too dark, or maybe it will balance them. Normally, the auto brightness contrast is uh, the thing that it's pretty good at. Although it's acting weird again. Ah, there, now it's going. Yeah, it looks good. I'll take a picture and see what happens. Uh, yeah, it's like, um, uh, let's see, Gemos, Sclerical, Gemo, Sclerical, something like this, I don't know. Uh, you look up Gemo and Sponge, it'll probably come up with it. 
Um, I'm not a sponge person, so um, let's see. I'm sure my mom is up there, or not my mom. Uh, my wife is up there somewhere trying to manage Sylvia. <laughs> yeah, you have to be a certain age, so she should wait until I'm home. Uh, Sylvia is a very nice name. Uh, we had this conversation. Oh, hi, Amberly. Um, we had this uh, conversation the other day that um, about um, naming and how we spent a lot of time trying to come up with my daughter's name. So, like, really uh, a long time debating different names. Um, it's just the one that we like the most, basically. So. <laughs> uh, New Jack, zero, 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 zero. Thank you for following. And thank you, uh, Pacific Plankton, for giving a shout out to Devil and Mrs. J. Devil and Mrs. J is sort of a crafting maker person and um, also does some game streams. Uh, it looks like a, a splat, right? Or like an action symbol. But it's going to be kind of a fun um, image for me to play with later. So <laughs> You're cleaning up the gnome zone? Uh, yeah, it means of the forest. Yeah. We have this problem, which is, uh, of course, my last name is Stone. Um, and uh, so that limits what you can name people, uh, unless you don't mind your kid having uh, being tortured. Because, uh, you know, like, if I named her Sandy, she would be Sandy Stone. And if I had gone with, like, Jem, right, uh, that would have been a bad one. Uh, or even if it was close, like Jim, probably would create a problem for her. So, um, sponge, I'm just call it sponge head. Because I don't remember how to spell gemosclerical. And I don't even know how, if that's the right, I know it's close. I'm not sure exactly what the word is. I'm sure you could Google it. Just kind of caught my attention because it was out here making an explosive look to it and uh, some other really interesting things on our uh, on this stub one of them is these guys which are actually um, organic components it should have been dissolved when Addie added, uh, when she processed the material. That is um, pediastrum, which is a type of algae, a green algae um, that grows in lake systems, usually when there's uh, high nutrients. And uh, you can see there's a couple of them in here. They look like little kaleidoscope type um, structures. And normally those would be gone. Sometimes they just, they're a little more resistant and they don't dissolve completely. These are the linking spines of an Olicocyra. So um, Olicocyra look like uh, the cylinders and um, this is Olicocyra ambigua, and Olicocyra ambigua only has linking spines, so it doesn't ha it doesn't make separation spines. It only makes the kind that kind of knuckle together. They always stay attached. And then there's a little portal right here that's on the outside edge of it, and that is the Rimaporchula hole. It's a specialized structure that they have. You can see there's one there as well, and one down here on this diatom as well, and there's one up there, just like dark spots, but um, if we could get an inside view where we could see it, they're usually like a little coiled shape, 
um, or a mouth-shaped uh, internal structure. And then this guy, while well, we're always looking at kind of weird stuff in here, uh, it's either a chrysophyte, no, it's a chrysophyte for sure. It's a little silica chrysophyte cyst, a stomatocyst. Um, it could have been a microsphere, but it's too big. Um, it's almost 10 microns across. So uh, there are some microspheres in these samples. They'll be like little tiny um, glass beads or plastic beads that we put in the sample. Um, they don't leave the sample, so it's not like we're polluting anything with them. Um, but they are used to um, allow us to determine concentrations. So the surface of one of those olicosiras on the valve view. So like I said, they're kind of usually uh, can shaped or cylinder shaped and sometimes they land on the on the edge. And also I think that's a phytolith right here. A little perfect sort of dog bone shape phytolith. a big cerella right there. It used to be Campylindiscus. And right here is a uh, epithemia. And I really like looking at epithemia in the SEM because the structure of their pores is very cool. So that is the raphe we're seeing right there. It's both branches of the raphe. And then there we go. You can see the pores. I like little four-leaf clovers. It's a very cool sort of character to them. Um, so they, they're sort of C-shaped openings. And we can zoom in a little closer so you can see them. Let's see if I can get it into focus. Um, Let's see, I need to... Um, I'm gonna leave that there for a second. I'm just gonna set it on a slow speed so we can see it. And then I'm gonna jump back in so I can sort of see what the um, stream is saying a little bit. <laughs> the, the stone. Uh, yes, Sylvia Stone's pretty good. Um, let's see. Uh, is it possible for brain neurons to be fossilized? I don't think so. Um, <laughs> she could be a Rolling Stone or Rosetta. Yeah, that Rosetta is another one that we came up with uh, as a cross off the list. Couldn't call her yellow. Uh, my wife wanted to call her lake, and I was like, you can't call her lake stone. That's like two objects. That's not a name, right? That's not a name for a person. Um, yeah. Gotta be careful. Uh, let's see. Diatoms make fun of each other? I doubt it. Um, you know, they're, they're probably just busy trying to get nutrients and, uh, and do their thing. They probably are. They probably don't know well enough to call something and uh, make fun of something or someone. I'm kind of concerned about what this is. Oh, it's a, another nidium, yeah? Where's Pandemic Watch when you need him?
There's a bunch of them. There's one here, there's one here, there's one here, one's here. There's a whole bunch of those nidiums. This one has cute little um, proximal rafi ends. They look like little perfect uh, shepherd's crooks, right? They just come in and curl. Cute little curls. This looks like a monster pinularia. It's a little dissolved. You can see the structure of the stri really well because the costi didn't dissolve everywhere, but here you can sort of see the, the tiny little areoli sort of s skin on the surface of it. And I think this is the same. No, that's a navicula. That's a navicula oblonga. Very long, skinny one that you sometimes could confuse with a pinularia. There's a little nidium. See, it's got like a little bit of a ridge sticking up that the reef is sitting in. It's just like a little raised surface. This is fascinating, but I got a split. See you around. All right, we'll see you out shot. Thanks for stopping in. Um, Cargo Cult said, is this a solution in water? It was in water originally, and um, then it was dried onto a little metal stub. Like this one. So we're just looking at the surface of one of these. Um, it's hard for you to see that, I suppose, because it's not enough of its focused but there so it's just like a little metal gold plated stub that we plated after we put the samples on it and um uh Nikutsi, the room is noisy because there's a, a vacuum pump and the vacuum pump is always running um to keep a vacuum in the SEM chamber and um believe it or not it's a little less noisy than usual right now um, it's not cooling or hot, it's just uh, the vacuum pump is over on the other side of the room. I tried to sort of blanket the sound a little bit to cut the noise down, uh, but that's just a per persistent noise in any scanning electron microscope. Um, they always have a pump associated with it. Um, all right, see you soon. Uh, thank you for coming and hanging out with us, uh, Gnome Fire, and for bringing your people over. And um, and for checking us out. Uh, those people who came along with uh, Gnome Fire, their uh, cool psychedelic stream, experimental jet set stream. Um, doesn't drying the solution destroy some details? Water has surface tension. Um, so for the diatoms, the, we're looking at their skeletons and in the original material, the diatoms were in water originally, but um, but we don't need to see the water part. So we just need to see the skeleton of the diatoms. So uh, removing the water when we dry it out doesn't actually do anything. A little bit of the particulate material might still be around. Um, do I have the OBS noise filter on my mic? Um, 
I'm not sure. Um, I honestly kind of like the pump sound as a sort of a white noise in the lab noise. Um, so I don't mind it that much. I don't need it to be like perfectly quiet in the, the lab. Um, it's probably just because the mic I have has really got a uh, high sensitivity and there's nothing in that sound range, um, you know, like the high pitched sort of noise it makes. Um, but I probably could fix it, um, but I actually don't, I don't mind it. And some people who, for whatever reason, uh, uh, come to my stream for, uh, they like the sounds. They kind of like the sound of the instrument, the sort of white noise hum of the instrument. So um, I, I don't know. I guess it's not that big of a deal. You just get used to it. Um, and I could play music or something, but for the same reason, um, I feel like people could just listen to whatever they want in the background and, um, and manage okay. This is a piece of a phytolith. There's another one of these pediastrums. Um, and chrysophyte cysts all over the place as well. And that's a phytolith, a long cell of a phytolith. And there's another one. Another piece of a pediastrum. This is a bit of uh, charcoal from plants. There's a round diatom. It is Lindavia. And I know that because that is an opening for the Rima Portula. And there's another one here. They are on opposite sides of the valve and they are on a thickened um, silica rib right here. See, it's sort of like a little bit thicker. Maybe it's not as obvious for you. And there's a third one over here. One, two, three. And um, if we came over to the margins of this and zoomed in, you'll be able to see here's the costi coming in. It's a little bit thicker. It's the sort of dimension that's between the areoli and as they come over the valve they fork you can see them sort of forking right here and here and right at the fork there's a strutted process on the outside of the valve it's kind of hard to see because it's just like slight differences in the size of the openings um, on the inside they're a little bit more obvious uh, to see and to recognize but I'm going to zoom in and take a picture, or zoom in, get the focus, and then zoom back out and take a picture of this one. Very good. Let's see. Uh, Devil and Mrs. J, I barely noticed the noise. Younger ears on headphones are more sensitive. Yeah, uh, almost certainly. Um, if you have headphones on or you're listening more closely or you have the volume up louder, um, it probably makes a big difference. So, <laughs> Cargo Cult says these fossil diatoms make me question my existence ancient plankton preserved in details and people dis disappear with no trace. Uh, that's not totally true. Uh, your bones will be left behind when you die, hopefully, and um, should be um, 
should be in a, uh, like the skeleton should remain, right? Uh, it's not going to disappear without a trace. Uh, it might go into uh, an incinerator, I suppose, if you want to be cremated or, um, or whatever. That might reduce the amount of your potential uh, skeletal remains. Yeah. So the forking and the little dots are maybe a little more obvious when we slow the beam down and start taking the pictures. So you can see out in here, they look a lot more obvious now probably than they did when I was, um, when I was, when the screen was still moving a lot. And you can see the hole here for the portal is wider. And then there's a sort of a thickened silica ridge right there. It's not really a ridge, uh, just like a costi. Uh, a wider component than the rest of the um, costi coming from the center. You can also see that the areoli in the middle have like a radiating pattern, right? Really obvious. But there's some of these little holes and then some of the bigger holes. And the little holes are all gathered around here in a couple of rows. And that's because these little holes are probably associated with strutted processes and these bigger holes are associated with, um, with areoli, um, with a domed uh, cribra on the inside. So uh, maybe we'll send, see an inside view of this diatom, and you'll be able to see some of those characteristics. You can see, again, the big thickened rib that this one is sitting on, and a bigger thickened rib that this one is sitting on that jut out, um, not quite 120 degrees apart, um, but they make sort of a triangle, right? Lindavia. I think it's Intermedia. Just call it that for now. It's really kind of flat. Uh, normally they have like a, a really strong concentric undulation as well. This one's, this one's a flat one. intensity is at 7. So I'm going to just move it up to 10. And you can see some more of this algae, some more of the synodesmus that's here. Some little tiny salafra. I think it's just pupula. That's a pretty interesting looking uh, nitsia with a big pointy, rounded, pointy tip to it. It's also very large. I kind of wanted to see what this guy was. It's a star anise. It's a little dark. See, it has a, a pseudoscepta. And then this thing that goes across the middle, which is called a staros, just basically a um, sheet of silica that's thicker. You can also see a little bit of the, um, when we use the scanning electron microscope and I put it at, um, at 30 kilovolts, uh, what happens is you can kind of see through diatoms a little bit um, because the beam is penetrating all the way through the material. It's thin enough that you can see through it. So it's like a piece of a diatom here. 
and you can see how it's lying underneath this one here and you can actually see through the diatom even though we can see all the diet the details on this diatom you know we can see very clearly um, the details of it uh, you can see also through it um, it makes these diatoms look somewhat transparent even though they're not well in real life they are but uh, they've been coated with gold so they're not This is the Staro, Staro or Syra uh, Construens. We saw one of these in Girdle View earlier. They have this sort of cruciform shape. It's a phytolith. Here's an in external view of that Staro Syra Construens on the valve face. You can see it's got little spines that hold it together with sibling valves. It's a Jara Sigma. You can see this sort of grid shape to the areoli. But uh, it's got junk right on the central area, so we can't see. Um, that part of it, at least, we can't see. the navicula. So it has little um, sort of rod shaped or slit shaped uh, areoli. So clearly a navicula. This one's got like a big cool like subcapitate end on it on both sides but it's under a piece of dirt. So Nitzia. Nitzia have this very distinct um, structure, like a keel. And these holes are called fibulae. And then they come down onto the, um, like a little bit, a little bit down onto the valve face, which is here. And <clears throat> the best I can do for focusing this right now is sort of like in here and it still looks blurry and the reason it still looks blurry is because I have my beam intensity set at 10 so decreasing my beam intensity actually gives me the power to focus a little bit better increases my um, the resolution of my image but it also makes it grainier when I zoom out so if I'm going to be spending a lot of time kind of zooming around looking for something um, you know out at this level it's usually better for me to um, put the beam intensity back around 10. Um, and then when I get zoomed in, such that I actually want to see the details, like at this level, then I usually set the beam intensity back to 7. Sometimes I just forget and keep running around at 7 uh, because I can see OK. but it looks a little bit better when you're out here at the speed at 10. So, this is Stephanodiscus, and this is a gyro sigma that does not have the central area all covered with junk. So hopefully we can get a nice clean view of it. And I mentioned that some of the other diatoms besides nidium have Rafies that go in opposite directions when they get to the center. And this is one of them. So when we switch down to beam intensity 7, you can see here's the Rafi and it curls this way. And from the other direction, curls the opposite way.
So a characteristic of nidium, but also a characteristic of gyro sigma. And I think pleuro sigma too. look closely at the surface of this stephanodiscus. So they have these big long spines that you can see sticking out and also um, associated with the side walls are these uh, structures here. Let's see if I can get any of this in better focus. So these are um, strutted processes. If we were looking at them end on, they would sort of be triangular shaped or, um, or sometimes clover shaped. And, um, and that's a rima portula. That's the labiate process. You can see the spine associated with the labiate it goes all the way through. And then on the valve face are a bunch of the little areoli because it's a stephanodiscus, they covered the entire face and Occasionally, a valve face photoportula, or what's sometimes referred to as a central photoportula, can be sound, seen. And as I told you, they sort of have like a triangular shape. One central hole, and then uh, little coverings over three little holes, in this case, making it look um, like a clover. You can see some of the domed cribra are broken, but many of them aren't. You can also see sometimes they only make two, sometimes they make three for this species. There's some right there as well. They kind of create a ring, like loose ring basically right here in the center. So I'm going to slow it down. And we'll get a good picture of this little um, fairy ring of Rima portula, or sorry, central photo, uh, central photo portula. And, um, I'll take that picture. I can see what chat's been saying, if anything. Hey, Dell's here. Hello, Dell. Um, let's see. You hope to turn into opalized fossil bone? Okay. I think you can make that happen. Um, if every one of your ancestors was turned into a diamond, you'd be rich. Uh, I guess so. Uh, Star Sarah do chain together. Yes. Uh, did diatoms change during the millions of years? Yes, diatoms will evolve over time um, for sure. Uh, good morning, Del. Uh, what's the reason for such small organisms to evolve? Diatoms evolve like anything else. They evolve because they need to respond or adapt to changing environments. So some, most kinds of evolution for diatoms probably happen when a new environment is created in a system that didn't used to have that type of environment. And think of it like an opportunity. So they'll evolve to that they can move into that new environment. Whenever I bounce back and forth, it somehow forgets. Yeah. Uh, roaches didn't evolve um, like many other creatures. Largely, be, well, they evolved a little bit, uh, but they don't do a lot of evolution because they're very well adapted to their environment. The more adapted you are to an environment, the less you need to evolve um, in order to continue, you know. Um, if you think about it, probably the perfect 
evolution for an organism would be to be so well adapted they would no longer need to evolve, right? And then they would switch typically at that point from um, sexual reproduction to asexual reproduction because they don't need any more new genetic material. They've reached sort of their pinnacle state. Static systems are boring. I think you're right. Uh, especially because they get rid of the sex. Especially boring. Um, let's see, we got stuff in a discus. This is Nigeri, I think. Or close to it. So um, I've just been scrolling around, looking at whatever comes into my field of view for a while now, which is sort of what I do during streams a lot. Um, I mentioned that I want to talk a little bit about uh, making 3D models from diatom uh, images on the scanning electron microscope and um, how we've done that. I know that we're not the only lab that's done it. Uh, we did it back in 2018 with a really nice, this is Criticula ambigua, or Criticula cuspidata maybe. Um, we did it with this, uh, this model that we made from, uh, from real diatom pictures in a scanning electron microscope and just took a bunch of pictures. So I want to talk a little bit about how I do that. Um, I'm not an expert at the photogrammetry software, but um, I can kind of explain the part that I was responsible for. And it's similar to, if you know anything about photogrammetry, it's a similar process no matter what tool you use. Um, the idea is basically you take pictures from all different angles and then um, it uses context between one from one shot to the next to basically place the object into 3D space. So it's kind of neat. Um, but I wanted to showcase it a little bit with some pictures and stuff. So let me find something cool here and I'll do like maybe a little um, and show you some of the pictures that we collected to make that model and then a little bit about the making of the model itself. Um, I can't tell you anything about settings or anything, but I can tell you the software that was used. going to um, first jump back to the middle, the first sample, the one that's right in the middle here, which is seven for us. Um, and we'll come back and look at the sample when I'm done sort of chatting about it, but I wanted to get like maybe something good, one good image collecting, and I can set it up to do like a 10 minute photo. And then I can sort of yak while it's taking the photo. an Olicasyra in valve view. You can see Olicasyra all over the place. They're the can-shaped things. This sample was just a little bit deeper into the core. This one's 16 centimeters down. 
The last one was 15 centimeters down. It's just slightly deeper. It's a nice image of a star of Syra. Star of Nice, sorry. Getting a little tongue tied with all the staros in the sample. too far. So speed eight, beam five. Let's see how that looks. It's maybe just a little dark. It's going to be okay. So I'm going to start that. And then while that's cooking, um, <laughs> so there's all sorts of cool things going on back here. Are there any diatoms that eat other diatoms? No, uh, but there are some that actually eat uh, detritus um, oddly okay so let's talk a little bit about um, this 3d modeling that we did um, this is the diatom that we ultimately made the 3d model from right there it's a diatom that I actually described and named that is um, Stephanodiscus coruscus from June Lake and um, what I did was, so that's what it looks like from an overhead view. You can see the stage tilt is listed um, right here on the image. And um, so this is our Stephanodiscus that's at um, zero degrees and the rotation is at zero degrees. So that's what that code is that's down here at the bottom. And um, it, you don't have to keep things at a consistent height, but you can see the, um, the diatom from the top was the one, this is the sort of view that we used. And then I'm gonna sort of flip forward through the photographs and you can see this was taken with a stage tilt at 15 degrees, right? And um, uh, you can see that diatom, keep your eye on this one right here and some of these right here. And you'll see what I did was turn the stage. So now I took the picture from a different angle, right? So I'm at 15 degrees and I'm just rotating it and um, here's another one it's that same diatom that other one so they're opposite sides of each other and um, we just keep doing this basically and rotate the diatom all the way around and then i tilt the stage to 25 degrees and 
do the same thing. So now we're getting a slightly different angle of that same diatom, right? Now 35 degrees. So there's just a steeper, um, a lower angle between us and the, the organism. And then 45 degrees. So now the stage is tilted at 45 degrees and I'm just spinning the, um, the carousel on there and taking a picture each time. Each one of these pictures took um, like five minutes to take. And so um, here at 45 degrees, I took, you know, however many photos. And then at 55 degrees, we took some photos. So now the stage is tilted at 55 degrees. You can see the spines and there's 60 degrees. I took some pictures to try to give us a whole characterization of it. You can see at 60 degrees, it looks a lot more like a, a cemetery of dead diatoms everywhere. Um, a landscape, right? Because when you get really low on it, starts to actually see the landscape of the stub. And um, it's a pretty neat view right there. It's like looking at all of the material. Um, and these things are another diatom that probably need to be described. That's a chrysophyte. Um, these ones are the same thing. These are the same species, the Stephanodiscus that I've described as Coruscus. So... Uh, and that's the whole thing. So we took maybe 70 photos of this diatom. And then, um, let's see, uh, what we did was we put it into this program. And you can see every one of the photos that I just showed you have been, um, their locations were identified by a computer. It could use the context of the image to try to figure out where was that picture collected from. And it did this. Uh, we didn't go in and tell it where to put them. It basically figured out, here's this item and its image. And then it placed all of those pictures um, where they went uh, relative to the objects that were in them. So, you know, like we didn't move. In our case, the SEM stayed still. The stage moved. But their apparent position is then determined by the computer by the pictures and it figures out how far they are away from each other and what angle they were collected at from the central uh, item and you can see all of the pictures are basically stacked up there which is pretty cool and then um, here it is at a low angle you can actually see uh, it it not only maps their image but also where they would be in that landscape right and once it has all of them there then it starts to build uh, a mesh of, of the three-dimensional object from all those different pictures. And it puts all of the pictures together and basically calculates what does that surface look like. And this program is called... Um, uh, uh, what's the name of that program? Um, Agisoft. And so then it created this thing, which is the version of it without a skin. So it doesn't actually have like the image mapped on top of it. The little holes that you see on there are actual holes in the material or depressions in the material in the model. And that is, you know, this model that you can see, right? So this is what we printed is that image right there, um, entirely created by SEM images. And it's a pretty cool process. Um, I don't know how to do any of the computer side stuff. For, it's not totally true. I sat in on a class while they were doing it, but um, it's kind of a neat process. And if you're really interested in, um, in seeing uh, the image modeled with the skin on it, oops, didn't mean to do that. I want to do this. And then you can actually see us manipulating, oh, that's me. I recorded uh, on uh, inside a, uh, a PDF file with the skinned version of the diatom mapped over top of the model and then all of the side stuff, the extra stuff trimmed out. So you can see from that, um, uh, from that link that I put in there, that's the um, Instagram video of it. Do, do I have the printed one? Yeah, here's the printed model, the 3D model. So it's just two of the flat ones. 
and then you could glue it together to make a whole diatom if we wanted to. So um, the person that I worked with, Dr. Alex Badillo, he uh, also cleaned some of the junk off of the material. And then basically we had an STL file when we were done and uh, we can actually provide the STL for it, um, for the, uh, the, the model if you wanted to print this diatom on your own uh, 3D printer. And somewhere, I was looking for it this morning, but I couldn't find it. There's a PDF with the actual like model in it, and it's in PDF form, which is totally weird, but it means anybody could open it. And um, uh, then uh, you could rearrange the image of the diatom yourself. You could rotate it around and look at it in all the directions. It's really kind of cool. Um, a neat thing that we did about um, two, three years ago, yeah. So there was like a whole bunch of stuff up here I missed. <laughs> um, hi, Anna, I didn't see you come in earlier. I think I started blabbing right when you, uh, right when you, um, uh, started. So Kanka13 says that they are an expert on photogrammetry, but they don't know much about SEM microscopes and their capabilities and limits. Um, so let me showcase this. Um, now that this image is collected, I can sort of show you. This, uh, the Tescan Vega 3 is the model that we use. And I actually um, really love this about it, which makes it easy. So people tried to do this before we did ours. Um, and they had a hard time with it because it's really hard to get the SEM to get you right into the right location all the time. Um, to spin it around is normally what you would do with photogrammetry is um, you put the object on like a, a lazy Susan, right? And you, it rotates around and then you hold the camera in place and take pictures of it as it turns. I mean, you don't spin it. Or you could also move the camera around the object and take pictures of it in many different positions. But more commonly, people put some sort of rotating stand in the middle that they can turn and then just take pictures and move the camera, like, you know, the angle of the camera. So that's basically what the SCM is doing. Um, here, let me switch back over to the inside of the actual SEM so you can see what I'm doing. And then um, you can change the height, which just is the distance pretty easily. So if I move this all the way down to like 25 millimeters away um, so that I don't accidentally jam anything into my uh, instrument. And I'll just leave this picture of this star anise up while we're doing this. Um, but you can see uh, I can rotate the image. Let's see, I guess I don't want to do that. I'll make it so you can see what I'm doing. Uh, yeah. So um, let's see, I'll do the speed at sort of a fast speed and the beam intensity at 10. And I'll change this brightness around so you can actually see what's going on. There we go. And I just need to focus a little bit because it got farther away. Okay, so here's our diatom. And um, I can rotate the stage very easily. So like it's at 25 degrees. You saw me do this earlier probably. You see the um, stage rotating in the little image where my head used to be and I can move that rotation wherever I want from 0 to 360 degrees so if I wanted to make it 290 or whatever it spins it around so if you're on the middle stub in that uh, chamber view that you're seeing it's fine most SEMs could probably handle that pretty easily but what happens if we're out on the edge like let's say we're on this stub out here which is number one and we wanted to rotate the stage around. So let's say I move it 90 degrees. Now watch what happens with the chamber when it does it. It moves the entire thing around while it rotates it to the right place. And the diatom that we had in our field of view is still in our field of view. So it does a bunch of calculations and it figures out where that diatom should be when the stage is rotated to the new position. So when I make it 180, it will rotate the whole thing and move the stage to a new position and calculate it. And now there's our diatom 
There's the chrysophyte that was in their field of view, right? And so the nice part about the test scan is it has an option to keep the diatoms or whatever in the field of view that when you rotate it, it recalculates where the stage is and puts that in the field of view. And it becomes really important when you get on the edges of the, of the stub because if I didn't have it in place, if I turn off that option and then I rotate the stage, so let's say I make it 150 instead of 180, it just rotates the stub. It just, and I'm, now I'm looking at blank space, right? I'm between stubs, which means it rotated, but then I've got to go figure out where that specimen went to, right? So I don't want that. Um, I want to be able to keep things in the field of view when I rotate it. Actually, I want to go back to 180 so I'm not off the stub. Um, but uh, so it's back where it was, right? When I rotated it back, but I also needed to recalculate where it goes. So what's cool about the, this model of the SEM, I think they maybe they have a, a Vega 4 out now or something, it, I don't know. Um, but it does it also when I tilt it. So watch what happens when I tilt the stage. Here's 10 degrees tilt. So it's turning the stage. There's our Alicocyra and there's our Chrysophyte and they're still in our field of view. And even though we're on this stub on number one, way out on the edge. So when you tilt it, it also keeps the thing in your field of view. And if I were to make it 20 degrees, it recalculates where that thing would be. You can see it's not perfect. There's our Chrysophyte, there's our Alicocyra, but I could find it again. If I were just to do that, just tilt the stage and not recalculate where that thing is, I'd have to go back and search through the entire stub and find, or maybe the entire chamber's worth of material and find that thing again. So this is what makes this a really powerful tool for photogrammetry because I can tilt the stage however far I want and it always keeps the diatom that I was looking at in the, or whatever it was, in the field of view at the same time. And, um, then I'd have to recalculate the height and, um, but once I have it there, like, let's say this is the angle that I want, I can still just rotate the stage and it recalculates where that new angle is. So if I go back in and do like 150, it recalculates it. I'm still on that thing. Now I'm tilted 20 degrees and I'm rotated and it keeps putting it back in the field of view. So it makes it really simple for me to keep collecting images, turn the stage and not lose the original specimen, which is like the real problem with um, trying to do photogrammetry in something like a scanning electron microscope. When you tilt it, you've got to deal with the consequences of tilting it, which means it's moving the stage all over the place. And in the old days, uh, you'd have to do it just a little tilt at a time and then put your specimen back in the field of view and then tilt it a little bit at a time and put it back in the field of view. But um, with this tool, basically, we're able to just jump around in the chamber um, to a new location and it will put the thing back into our field of view correctly. So it's super powerful on that level. And it's actually one of the reasons why I selected this scanning electron microscope. So we could make um, 3D models doing it um, with anything that's in here. It's just that it's really, really time consuming. So this model that we made from images, you know, I spent five minutes on each picture. So it's five minutes, then rotate it 10 degrees or 20 degrees or whatever you want, and then take another picture and then rotate it again. And you gotta go all the way around and then you gotta make rings at different tilt values. And so I think I spent like three days taking pictures. Um, but the details on the model are really kind of impressive. And also I didn't have to do anything else after that, right? I just handed over the files to um, a photogrammetry person. They stuck it into Agisoft and then um, it spit out this really cool model that is made, you know, based on the organism itself. So not just like guesswork or somebody doing it in AutoCAD or whatever, but, um, but the actual organism. So um, I really like that about it. And I think it's kind of a neat um, process. And so people have asked me about it a little before, and I thought I could go into it a bit this weekend just to uh, have something interesting to talk about um, while I was taking pictures of stuff. 
I didn't get to go on too much of a, a diversion um, about it. I didn't have to go way out, but um, uh, but so for people who were hanging out wondering when am I going to start talking about the photogrammetry part, that's it. Uh, that's all I really wanted to sort of talk about. Um, we've tried it again. So um, we did try to do it with another diatom, with an anumastus, which isn't round. And I thought maybe it would go a little bit better. But for some reason, the Agisoft software couldn't figure out like how to place the pictures correctly. So I don't know what we did wrong and um, whether it was just issues with the, like, the way the picture was taken or the resolution it was taken at. Um, or the size of the images changed a little bit. Um, normally those things wouldn't be a problem, um, or at least I'm told they wouldn't be. So I'm not sure what the issue was, and we never figured it out. Um, I didn't uh, spend too much time delving into it because it was just a project that I gave to uh, Mallory to do, and then uh, and when I handed it off to my photogrammetry person, they are like, yeah, that didn't work. So whatever you did, you did something different but I don't know what we did different. Um, it could have just been there was something on the stage that was charging or uh, creating a problem for the rest of the image. Like if there's a defect in the image, maybe it didn't know how to handle it. So it's a bit of a question mark what went wrong, um, but uh, I probably will try it again one of these days. I probably wouldn't want to try to do it on stream because uh, like 80 pictures of the same diatom gets real boring um, but, uh, you could do it with fewer than 80 pictures. You could do it with like four pictures if it were, it's just going to be like a lower quality model. Um, if it's something like this that has spines coming off in every direction, you kind of need to have a whole bunch of angles though. So we're looking at a chrysophyte, uh, stomatocyst right now. It just looks like a balloon with spikes coming out of it. I like to think of them as Christmas tree ornaments because this one has like a little, this is where the, the ornament hanger would go, right? Like a little opening, a whole hollow opening called an aperture or a percula um, that the organism would crawl in and crawl out of. And um, they would usually climb in here, um, hibernate for, for winter and then come out uh, again in the summer or the spring probably um, so it's like a way for organisms to persist through winter conditions so i'm gonna grab this picture so i can come back and chat a little bit i was busy sort of blah blah blahing and moving around um and i missed all the conversation about what's going on yeah some can be mixotrophic It's hard to eat anything when you live in a glass castle. I would like to give it a shot. Um, you found a paper for a specific? Yeah. Um, a free item no one can ask for. Well, I can give it to you. The, not the item, but uh, the model I can post actually. Maybe I'll do that, put it on the Discord channel. Um, <laughs> um, let's see, I'm really far behind in the channel, so I'm just trying to, are you getting a degrees in, in radians, open set, you're just trying to give us math, no one caught it, oh well, the math experts. A lot of diatoms from Maine, the diversity is mind-blowing and the client wants biovolumes. Ugh. Yeah, I was swinging the diatom around in that stage area. Yeah. <laughs> that is a scientific term. Uh, she's working in freshwater stuff. Sorry, Pacific. And yeah, we had to edit the model just a little bit. Um, uh, I don't think we made it any flatter. I think that's actually the, uh, the way the diatom was. Um, more diatoms in modern architecture. Oh, I, maybe I'll do that one of these uh, next times. We'll do one where I focus on that a little bit and talk about structures that we see in diatoms and then structures we see in architecture. It'll be fun. 
Oh, uh, you'd like to the angled shot? I have that. Uh, it's just a, a tiff. I'll post it to the Discord along with um, maybe the PDF and um, and also the the STL if you wanted to print it on a 3D printer. So yeah. Hey, tropical geek, how you doing? People who do not sleep. That's me. Uh, who needs sleep? Uh, Rex X generator. Hi, new there. This is a diatom like, like algae. Yes. This is their skeleton. Uh, right now we're looking at a stomatocyst from a chrysophyte though. And hello, Glorgana. Glor Glorgana, yeah. Thank you for giving her a shout out as well. Um, Glorgana does some cool taxonomy stuff. <laughs> You've been lurking for a while, but seeing how the device works is blowing your mind. Well, uh, that's what I like to do here, is just blow people's mind with my cool toys that I get to play with all the time um, that are in my lab. This is a chrysophyte stomatocyst. Uh, I also like to apparently get really far behind in the chat and then desperately struggle to try to catch up with, with where I was and usually fail to get there before people have already moved on to the next thing and I didn't get a chance to really even answer the questions. If that's the case, and Anna didn't answer the question, or Pacific Plankton didn't answer the question, you could always ask it in the Discord. This is a uh, Karyevia, I believe. Yeah. I haven't seen any of those. Other side of the other side of the valves, though. What's this? We'll get a close look at this pinularia. It's got like a giant silica plate covering over the middle part, and all the cool stuff is hiding behind it. Uh, did you find anything good in your uh, main samples, Anna? Some exciting thing you want to send me? Oh, a Cerverella. With a hole in the middle of it. <laughs> Something took a bite out of it. Or maybe it just dissolved. Oh, we're, um, we're way far away, too. I should fix that. One thing I forgot to do when we were... So uh, usually when I do any photogrammetry from the scanning electron microscope, I should say that um, I don't usually use the whole carousel. So down in the stub holders, we have this thing that's holding like seven stubs at once. And usually when I do um, some sort of photogrammetry, I will, uh, I'll just put one stub in and the other ones I only work on because I'm going to be taking pictures from just one diatom basically. Uh, or one whatever, and I don't need to have all of the stubs on there. Um, also, it's a lot less likely that I'll jam one uh, little diatom stub into the machine and break it. Um, if you're tilting the stage, you have to be super careful um, because, um, you know, if you're focused on something over here and you tilt the stage this way, uh, you can jam it right into the, um, the pull piece. Uh, which would break the instrument and cost me tens of thousands of dollars. So I don't usually do that uh, without really carefully, you see me stop and look at everything, make sure I'm not making a terrible mistake. Um, because if you get comfortable 
and you get a little too comfortable with it, um, you could get careless. And then uh, that's going to be a really costly mistake if it is, if it happens. So um, I didn't get us quite back as close as we were, which is okay. Um, the distance to the sample really only matters with respect to the depth of focus. And um, that could have been some of the problems with the Enumastus that we were collecting the data from. In fact, maybe we were a little too close. And so the depth of field wasn't very good. And that's one of the things that I just, I didn't think through completely because they're a little bit more three-dimensional um, in terms of total, because the diatom's bigger. There's more of it that could have been out of focus at the same time. And so maybe we could try it again, um, but not, not get so close to the diatom. Uh, it'll work better next time. So it's on my things to try. Okay, what's going on with speed seven not showing it changing? It's like it doesn't want to draw it. Okay, seven, seven, good to go. And I can come back and interact for a bit. You're gonna have to go make lunch for the family? Okay, no problem, Pacific Plankton. I think there's other people here that can handle it. Hello, Two Chooks as well. Uh, I think if you start streaming, reading kids' books, your streams would skyrocket in popularity. I don't know if you're allowed to read books. I think maybe they would, they would probably block it from recording it. I mean, I could do it and then, then I would get yelled at, I think, I have to delete the, there's at least one kid's book about diatoms. Yeah, there's a kid's book where they, it's like a coloring book um, about it as well. Yeah. Oh, Vizaria, hello. How are you doing? Um, oh, and you gave a shout out to her, great. Uh, we're looking at um, diatoms in the scanning electron microscope and um, Uh, we can get real close with the scanning electron microscope. Um, Rex X Generator said, I was so bored today and randomly found this channel and this is dope. Thank you. I think it's dope too. Um, how are you doing, Fizaria? Hopefully you're, I've seen, I've been watching your streams, you know, checking in on you while you're singing and stuff. Seem like they're going well. Um, hopefully you're going to get a little bit more microscope time in eventually here. It's like a weird, it's like it shifted whatever I took downward when I went to take the picture. It's like a bigger gap. Something weird's going on. I'll have to check the settings when I'm done. Um, how sensitive are diatoms to acidity? Very. It's one of the primary things that they use to reconstruct, uh, diatoms to reconstruct. Does a tiny Cirella count? Uh, I mean, maybe. 10 microns long? Those are pretty small. Um, if fridge magnet's significantly far from the fridge, then it won't attract, if the moon won't attract to the earth. So what's the difference between mass and charge? What, are you asking like weird, Sciencey questions. Um, <laughs> the business end of the SCM expensive to replace. Yeah, it is. Uh, everything in here is expensive to replace. You don't want to have to replace stuff in it. Um, it's cheap to run, believe it or not. Uh, the expensive part, if you were, um, if you owned it like we do, um, the expensive part is the maintenance person to come and 
repair stuff or fix things or whatever um, is usually a pain in the butt. They're expensive. And then if you were using somebody else's, it would be very expensive. Like they usually charge 50 to 80, sometimes like $120 an hour to use it. Um, mostly you're paying for the technician to sit there with you and you know, help you get better pictures because I already know how to do that. I'm my own technician. Um, it doesn't cost very much money for me to run the scanning electron microscope. Um, typically it's something like $60 for a filament, which is the thing that's giving us the, um, the picture. And then the nitrogen, I don't know, it's not very expensive to rent a tank of nitrogen. Um, but those are the things that are the expenditures. And then um, you need typically a, um, a sputter coater, which has a target that's gold. And we maybe go through it once a year, one a year um, at about, those are each one are about 800 bucks. So, um, you know, that's expensive, but, um, but only once a year. So it ends up not actually being a lot of money. There's another cool chrysophyte. Chrysophyte stomatocyst. stomatocyst. You see little holes in it. And then it has these cool like fin-like structures all over it. Some of them are in these sort of maze shapes. This is, um, again, uh, the organism that lives in this is uh, a golden brown algae called chrysophyte, senura, and um, those sorts of things are kind of in that group. Um, and it's being a pain in the butt about being in the center of the screen because I can't figure out where the direct middle is. That should work. So I'm just gonna get it into focus and then I'm gonna back off a little bit so I can get a whole picture of it. Slow the speed down and the beam intensity is already at six, seven. So I'm gonna leave it there and then I can take a picture. It takes about three minutes to collect the picture and I can come back and chat a little bit about what's been going on. Um, proper copper, why are you asking us physics questions? Um, I remember uh, coccolithophores, yeah, uh, those are in the marine realm. Um, there's a, I could put some on if you wanted to. Um, there's, this whole stub here is all full of coccoliths. Um, in, in our department, there's another person who studies those, and sometimes you'll see them in the little um, images that I've colored below. Pandemic watch. How's it going? Uh, I wanted to show you these uh, nidium and uh, gyro sigma that we found earlier. You weren't on yet. Um, so now we're looking at, uh, yes, it's a nice Simba pleura. Uh, so now we're looking at some chrysophytes, but when it's done, I'll see if I can find you one because you like those. Um, my stigun, my stigun, mystigun. Good evening. It's just barely afternoon here. Um, Read the coloring book to people. It does look a little bit like a rose. Is the filament the electron emitter? Yeah, so the filament's the part that's up here in the electron gun. Um, it's made out of tungsten and like a light bulb, basically. Um, you put a charge through it, and then it makes a cloud of electrons up here in this Feinhold cap. And then um, this anode with a positive charge pulls the electrons out and focuses them into a stream uh, and accelerates them down towards the sample. And uh, the magnets that are in between um, help focus the beam. So keep the, the electrons going in a straight line effectively. Uh, on the surface of this, yeah, I think they're little pores, but this isn't a diatom. Um, it's the, it's the like, uh, structure that the chrysophytes hide in over the winter. And, um, I don't know what the ridges do. They have different ornamentation. All, all of the chrysophyte cysts have like totally different ornamentations. Some of them are totally boring and just look like a little, like 
round ball with an opening. They always have an aperture. Um, for the one that we have in the field of view right now, I can't see an aperture, which means it's face down or around the bottom hemisphere and uh, probably over here somewhere, um, but we can't see it. But I know it's a chrysophyte because I know chrysophytes often have these crazy fins on them. And um, chrysophyte two. Um, and it's otherwise spherical. So there's a, it's a good clue. Let's see. Um, so you can see it's very rounded. I saw a whole bunch of nidium in this sample, so we'll find one for you. Pandemic watch while we're digging around looking at chrysophytes. So there's the one we were on, right? And you can see some more chrysophytes here. I think that's probably one right there. There's a little round one at the end of this diatom. Oh no, that's not a chrysophyte. That is, I'm not sure, maybe it is a chrysophyte because that looks like a piece of a chrysophyte. Yeah, I think it's just stuck on the end of this. Sometimes diatoms will make uh, a new cell, like when they're growing uh, through sexual reproduction, they'll produce a big round cell like this on the end. It's just weirdly placed. That's a chrysophyte. Those are chrysophytes. They're all little, like Christmas tree ornaments, you know? A little round globe. Here's another one. Pretty easy to pick out in these samples. There's one. Oh, here's one with a little tube, like a nose, like a weird little nosy tube sticking off of it right? That's where the organism crawls in and out. And then uh, I think it must seal it up for the winter time or something. But uh, it looks like a balloon or something weird, right? A little bit of a tube sticking out uh, where the hanger would normally be for our, our Christmas tree ornament. Um, some other things in the sample that are also pretty cool. There's a bunch of phytolists laying around on the stage, but I was in my way looking for these. Uh, that's an internal view of a nidium, so we won't be able to see that the raphes are going in opposite directions, but that's an external view of one right there for a pandemic. As requested, raphe ends are going in opposite directions. That is a nidium, and I believe that is I don't know, iridus or something kind of close to iridus. They have this like weird cigar shape to them. Something like iridus. And then, so they, as they come towards the center, this is the central nodule. It's like a big thick piece of silica. Um, they go in opposite directions. And when they come towards the outside edge, the terminal edge, they fork in like a little Y shape. Like one goes this direction and one goes that direction. That's a classic um, structure for nidiums. This is a, a phytolith in here, a little saddle or something. It's a piece of that pinularia. It's all broken off. These are all olicosiras, these little Looks like somebody threw a bunch of beer, cran beer cans in my sample. There's a star. Uh, Cerarella. These always look like really cool. They've got kind of like a fingerprint structure on the valve faces usually. When they're in focus. It's not totally obvious in this one. Let's sort of see it in here a little bit. They've got like a ridge, uh, like a, a set of bumps, right? Uh, what's interesting about the Cerarellas and related genera is that the raphe goes all the way around the outside edge. 
So one branch of the raphe starts here and wraps around to here, and the other branch of the raphe starts here and wraps all the way around to here. So they have what's called a circumferential raphe. Oh, here's another chrysophyte. As long as we're looking at them, this one's like a little puffer fish. It's got spikes in every direction. And there's the aperture right there. I don't study chrysophytes. Um, I study diatoms, but they're often found in my samples. So um, I learned some of them. I recognize them, but I don't know their names because a lot of chrysophytes, they just gave them numbers. And all the books I have, just they have numbers. So I'm not going to memorize. That's number 36. Um, and that's because they usually don't know the organism that's associated with the chrysophyte cyst. So they know that an organism created it that's different than the actual cyst. sure about the genus for this one. It's got Cirrella vibes right here, or no, sorry, Salophora vibes right here. It's got like a curved central area, single pores. I'm gonna go with Salophora. I don't know, Anna, what do you think? This looks like maybe it's got a silica plate. Pretty slothroid. Take a picture. I can come back and see what's going on. Uh, let's see. What I miss? Somebody wants Sylvia to draw a picture for them. Um, well, Sylvia's not here right now, so uh, Satan, I will see about getting a picture for Sylvia for you. Uh, do they stick somewhere or float free? Um, I think they stick in the sediment. I don't think they float. Uh, nice view. It's 2 a.m. It's hard to understand how small it is. Oh, two microns. It's two. Yeah, they're very small. Um, it's got a lot of little windows in its house. Yeah, it's a good way of thinking about it. Endless. Um, I don't know why the little the little holes are there. I'm not sure. <laughs> You're going to have to shovel some snow. Gross. Um, are you calling everything small a salophora? What you don't think it has characteristics of a salophora? I feel like the center looks very salophora. The rafy. Is so Salafra Rafi, the central area is a bow tie with like curved stri and the pores are simple single holes. So it does look like a Salafra Sensu very lato. Broadly, yeah. The genus is a mess, yeah. I'm, I'm aware of that, but uh, I don't know what this is otherwise. 
if only we had somebody who would look into the genus for us, you know, really seriously look at it. That's where I would stick it though. Like if somebody asked me, where do you think this goes? I would start with Slothra. I suppose it's a good one to get an SEM image of because I don't know what it looks like in the light microscope. <laughs> is it a challenge? Yeah, it is a challenge. Figure it out for us. Salopharoid. Uh, so I'm calling it Salopharoid. We find out it's a Slothra, and then you gave me a bunch of grief about it. Then, then what? Look at that. Oh, it's only part of the pediastrum. All right, it's uh, getting close to closing time, I think. It'd be a good time for me to find us one last good thing to look at hopefully. And, uh, what's oh, a sponge spicule? What's this guy? It's the plain old navicula. Oh, he's got a friend, a chrysophyte friend. Hmm. Not sure about the name of that diatom. That is a really monster-sized navicula, though. Like, um, really big. And it's too bowed out for a blonga, so it's like aurora or something in that, um, that group. and 25 microns. So I think I could probably fix that a little bit. I need to move this here. And then... Let's get it to go right down the rafi. to fight with me. Stop fighting with me. There we go. Yeah, 125 microns, something like that. Hmm. That's a good question. Probably doesn't need to be an SEM image, though. There is a Blanga in here, though. It's like a little eye, it's looking at us. Simbaplura again. I like that one. And there's just the head of a, a Styrianella with the rim of Portula visible. Something probably broke it off. Big stack. Oh, it's a phytolith. Mm. 
I'm going to take this picture for Chad. This would be a good sample for uh, his class to look at because there's a bunch of diatoms and phytoliths and chrysophytes in it. Plus it's already prepared. It looks like a little tiny octopus tentacle. Lunch is accomplished. Yeah, it's a little knobbly, tentacle looking phytolith. I don't think it was an average size. 125 microns? That's not average for navicula, is it? Or did you mean something different? I have not had lunch. Uh, I did eat breakfast though, so. But I'm gonna stop soon and then I'll be able to go to lunch. So I'll be able to get my lunch anyway. Um, I feel like I've accomplished most of the things I wanted to accomplish for today. And um, So we'll get maybe one more image after this one, and then I'll call it an afternoon, and I'll go eat my lunch, and then I'll start working on lectures, and apparently Sylvia wants to stream Minecraft or Slime Rancher, so I'll probably end up getting sucked into streaming Mine Rancher, Slime Rancher, Minecraft, or Slime Rancher. I think part of my inability to put words together is because I haven't had lunch. Hello, dangling. How are you doing? I'll let you know. Um, you're lurking. can hang out with us for a bit, right here at the end, as I'm getting ready to shut everything down. For a minute there, Pacific, I thought you were trying to say that you made knobbly sandwiches for lunch. And I was kind of wondering what kind of sandwich was novelly. It's like a deteriorating star anise. See, it's completely dissolving. And the skeleton's falling apart. So preservation doesn't always happen. Sometimes it starts and then... gets destroyed.
Mm, that's a Slafra. That one's not even a question. It's kind of an interesting one. Starasyra, I believe. Again, Construence. That's like a stack of two and a half cells. Alakasira Ambigua. Some barely visible Rosathidium. And then this giant Pinularia. I kind of like this look. Into the inside with the areoli visible through these chambers. Like right there. Maybe? Scanning windows. A weird shape, and that's why I keep getting the wrong dimensions. Hmm. Better. I feel like that's too dark. I do not like the way it has selected. I guess you could still see them. Mm. I could just brighten it here too though. Much better. All right, speed seven, happy with the settings, ready to go, taking a picture. And then this will be our last picture. And um, now's a good time for me to say thank you for hanging out. And <laughs> B 
barely visible is what SEM is for. I know. I know. Uh, let's see. Um, but look, you can, you can see these little tiny pores, and you can't see those in the light microscope. Um, you'd like to look at Kool-Aid. <laughs> I don't know that Kool-Aid's going to make for a very good um, stream, but you know what? We can get the crystallized version of Kool-Aid, and I can put some on a stub, and I'll do it for those 5,000 uh, attack points you just spent, breaded. Shrimp will do it um, Wednesday, maybe, a uh, Wednesday stream. Um, you have a particular flavor of Kool-Aid you want us to look at? Um, I want to say thanks to Pacific Plankton and give a shout out to the whole squad. Um, OpenSet and Dell uh, were here today. Fazeri was here today. Um, and I know that um, Freckled Science is streaming right now and District 10 Mushrooms was here today. So uh, we almost had the entire squad um, checking in with us and hanging out for a while, which is great. Um, any one of those people would be great choices to follow if you're interested in microscope streamers. And um, I want to say thank you to Anna uh, for checking in, hanging out with us. Um, my uh, fellow diatomist colleague. And um, we had a, uh, a couple of other great streamers that were also hanging out in the channel with us. And um, we had a, a raid earlier in the stream from Gnome Fire. Um, we had a subscription from Kalathon really early on, um, followed by Outshout and New Jack and Read Gen X and um, uh, Proper Copper, Dylan Griffith, uh, Burr's, Burr's, Burr's Lab, um, Mr. Gun and Fun Drum Fun and uh, that was uh, the follows for the most part, and um, it would be nice to if uh, if diatoms in North America would sort by selenium. Yeah, if they did any sort of um, environmental sorting, that would be great. All right, so let us find somebody to raid, and I guess we'll probably go with um, Freckled Science because she wasn't here, and um, because she was busy streaming. And we can all go visit with Amanda. I like to go hang out in Amanda's channel as well. Um, so she's a lot of fun, high energy. Most of you probably already know her. And uh, it was, it was a fun stream. And um, we looked at a lot of cool stuff. I got some pictures for Addy. So that's a positive. We got to talk about photogrammetry. We got to do a little bit about the 3D modeling. But lots of cool stuff. So, um, uh, good hangout time for this, like, two and a half hours we were running. Still didn't find it. Uh, I don't know what you're trying to remember. I missed that part. Uh, maybe post something about it in the Discord, Panda, and uh, I'll see if I can find it, uh, whatever it is you're trying to figure out. So, all right. Uh, thanks, everybody, and we'll be back on probably Wednesday uh, with another SEM stream, and I might also do a light microscope stream later, uh, you know, in the week sometime in the evening. Uh, we'll see. So, um, thanks, and now we'll go, and I hope everybody has a good weekend. Stay safe, stay warm, and uh, we'll catch you next time.